quite proud and honoured to think that so many of you are available to come and join us this evening um, as we put on this talk in partnership with uh, the Unis Sports Hub. And really uh, happy to have Professor Mohammed Yunus here to join us this evening uh, to give us a, uh, some guidance and, and some talks about um, the importance of social business in sport. For me personally, I think this is amazing. Um, it's such uh, an important topic. And when we think about sport and the importance it plays in our day-to-day -day world, and having worked around uh, the games for many, many years, and worked in sport for many, many years, I have observed how sport can change the world. It has the power to change and make differences in every level. And so for me personally, I find it, this topic is uh, really important, and I'm really, uh, like I say, quite honored to be able to talk about this um, with, and share this with you today. So, you didn't come here to hear me talk about it. <laughs> um, so, without further ado, I'd like to introduce <coughs> Professor Mohamed Yunus, and welcome Thank to you. the stage and to the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like me to sit someplace? Okay. Okay. Good evening. Well, I'm delighted to be here with the. <clears throat> global capital of sports at uh, something everybody knows the name but don't know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a fun to be here the right at the place. And we got close to each other, the um, IOC and um, other sports related organization based here. And our work, uh, the social business, quite accidentally, it was not uh, planned that way, but um, got to know each other and uh, got very close after that, very enthusiastic about each other. Before that, we had done uh, lots of social businesses in different places in Bangladesh and also around the world. And that was something which was coming out of we started in Bangladesh called microcredit. You're familiar with the name perhaps. Lending tiny little money to poor women. It's a tiny little money not because we're stingy about it. It's because they couldn't handle more than that. That's the money they could handle. Uh, be beyond that, that's a kind of, uh, they get shocked that so much money, they don't know what, how to do with it. So we had to do with the little money. And that's how the word micro came in, micro credit, lending small amount of money. Not because we are uh, experts on credit or anything, I had no background in credit or banking. I'm just a teacher in this university, teaching economics, but it's just, problem that people face next door to the campus, in the villages, the women, the poor women, and also poor men, uh, not having access to any money. They become victims of loan shark. And the, the loan shark come with the offer of money, but in, the, in exchange, they almost grab everything, whatever they have. That's what the loan sharking is all about. At that time, I had no idea how widespread that loan sharking is in Bangladesh. But gradually, the more I came close to it, I discovered this not only village next door to the university where I taught, it's all over Bangladesh and it's all over the world. There's no country in the world which is out of the scope of loan sharking. In different places, they are called different names. In some countries, they are called... Uh, banks. Banks, not only banks. <laughs> well, the pawn shops and all kinds of things that you can see. Well, in every way, the banks, some banks may be doing that too. <laughs> but uh, this is the problem, so, so we... Uh, 
try to see if something can be done getting over that loan sharking, how to get the loan sharking out of the village. One idea that came, of why don't I lend the money myself? The idea is, if I lend the money, people don't have to go to the loan shark. And they have to stop their business because now they have an alternative source of money. So that's how it all began, a small amount of money out of my own pocket. It's not that uh, I made it a big project or something like that. It's just an informal, individual initiative that you want to do. So I did that, giving tiny little money they needed as a loan. And made it very clear that they don't have to follow the same rules of the loan sharks. They can just return the money that I give them. Nothing extra for them. And everybody loved that. Who wouldn't? Mm -hmm. So it became bigger and bigger. And I was very happy that the people liked that. And I could solve the problem for the people. And then, uh, after a while, my money was running out. So I was thinking of creating a small bank in the village so that I can use this money for banking purposes. But banking need licenses, permissions, regulators, and all kinds of things. So it's not easy. So it took a lot of time to get the permission from the government to do that. When we finally did that, we created a bank. We called it Grameen Bank, or the Village Bank, because it's created for the village. Mm -hmm. We started in 1976, and then we became a bank in 1983. So this is the period when I had to do it on my own. And when we became a bank, it worked beautifully, not within the village, it now expanded. Very soon it became a nationwide bank. And then other countries became interested because nobody thought it's possible to lend money to poor people. Everybody laughed at it when we began. They thought all the money will be just disappear. No, nothing will come back. How, why should any person give you money back? Because in our system, there is no legal document. Because if you're lending such a small amount of money, it's not worth having legal documents and spend all the money on the, on the lawyers. So we created a system where we don't need any legal papers. Still, money comes back. And people said, oh, this will not going to survive. People are smart enough <coughs> to stop paying you back because there's nothing to catch them. You have to catch them if they don't pay back. I said, no, if they benefit from it, they will always pay back. They thought it's such a nice words. Doesn't look like it's going to work. I said, as long as uh, I don't have any experience to the contrary, I'll continue. And I didn't have any experience to the contrary, so I continued. And it became known to other countries, other people. They started copying it. So microcredit became a global phenomenon. Every country in the world started microcredit program. And I had to come to Switzerland many times because this is, the, again, a global capital of banking. <laughs> and they became very curious because I'm accusing the banking a lot. I said, banking has been done in a very wrong way. Banks are supposed to lend money to people, and that's their job. But the bank do it in a very funny way. They lend money to people who already have lots of money. <laughs> and they don't lend money to people who don't have money. I said, that's very strange. <coughs> it should have been the other way around. Banks should lend money to people who don't have money. And after they have done that, then they gradually go up. Of course, banks laughed at me. That is such an innocent way of talking that the bank should lend money to people without money. How can they pay back? And they keep saying that uh, they cannot lend money to poor people because they are not credit worthy. And I keep asking them, should they decide 
the fate of the people by saying who is creditworthy or who is not creditworthy? Or should they ask, should the people that they are judging should be judging them, the banks, whether they are people worthy? I said the fault is not people not being creditworthy. The fault is banks are not people worthy. So you have to redesign yourself so that you are worthy of serving the people. They laughed again. This is not something making any sense for them. We said we created a bank which is people worthy because it works for people. Even the person who doesn't have a penny, we work for them. So that became a permanent controversy between our work and the conventional banking world. But since it works, we had the last word because it works, no matter how much how we argue. They said that it may last for a while, but it will disappear very soon. We have been doing it for, for over 40 years now. I think it's just long enough to establish the fact it works because it has not collapsed, rather it flourished. We even do it in the United States. We have a bank or, or an <coughs> organization called Grameen America. We lend money to poor in uh, American cities. It started in New York City 10 years back in one place, and then it became so successful, it is replicated in many other cities. New York City now has seven of those branches, Grameen America branches. In other cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, Miami, and many other cities. We have 24 branches in the United States in 15 cities. In 10 years, we have over 150,000 borrowers, all women, 100% women. We have given over a billion dollars in loans in perfect repayment. Repayment is over 99.5% and above. And the characteristic feature of the Grameen is there is no legal papers, neither in Bangladesh nor anywhere else, including in the United States. People get very shocked. How can you lend billion dollars without any papers? Individually loans are small. Like in the United States, Startup loan is always under $1,000. So people are borrowing $500, $700, $800. And then after you pay back, you get slightly higher, slightly higher, and so on. You go by steps. But no papers, no legal documents. So we are the lawyer-free banking. No lawyers. <laughs> they, they are not happy with us. <laughs> but it works. So this is what the microcredit part working. Then we saw many other problems of the poor people in Bangladesh. And we started creating other types of business. Like we saw this problem, we created a business called microcredit. We saw the health problem, so we created another business of healthcare, providing healthcare to people, giving a healthcare insurance program, and then provide all the healthcare for the poor people. Technically, healthcare is supposed to be um, free in Bangladesh, like in many other countries, but it's not available because the system doesn't work. You have hospitals, you have clinics run by government, very inefficient. In most places, doctors don't exist. In almost all places, medicines don't exist. So those are the kind of things. So people suffer. And in the meantime, wrong medicines flourish. In the name of health, people sell anything. And people become the victim. So we created a healthcare program. So now we run hospitals, we run clinics. And then we created many other businesses, businesses to, to bring solar energy in the villages, because people don't have electricity. So we created a solar energy <coughs> company to bring electricity to people's homes so that you don't depend on kerosene. Kerosene creates fumes, and fumes are very bad for your health. And homes are 
are very small. So all the fume generated by kerosene lamp circulates within the stage within the house. And women become the victims of that particularly because they spend more time in the children. So they have the diseases related to breathing because of the fuel that we use for lighting. So we thought we can do it uh, with solar energy. So we created a company <coughs> to bring solar energy and sell solar energy in the villages. And it worked very well. It became very popular. We have now over 4 million homes with solar energy. And every time, every time we see a problem, we create a business to solve it. And these are the businesses we created. And we created more than 50 such companies. Then we, other people say, why are you running these kind of businesses? Because you say, in this business, you don't want to make money. How can you create a business while you don't want to make money? I said, is there a law that I have to bring money home? Otherwise, I'll be put in jail. I said, I like it. That's why I do it. Because it solves people's problem. So this controversy continued, whether this is a business or not a business. In order to distinguish it, we started calling it social business. So that people are not confused between the conventional business, profit-making business, to a business where you don't want to make profit. Profit stays with the business. So we call it social business and define it by saying it's a non-dividend company to solve human problems. That idea has expanded. One company in France became very interested, a French company called Danone, familiar, not very far from Evian here. They became very interested. We created jointly a company of social business to solve the problem of malnutrition in Bangladesh, of the children. Not to make money out of the business, but to solve people's problem. And our, gradually other companies became interested. We continued to create other businesses. So while I was invited in uh, Rio Olympic to address the Olympic Committee, about my experience, about microcredit, social business. I strongly advocated that uh, sports is a subject which should be exposed to social business. My argument was sports is a big power, enormous power. We're just discussing about cricket in Bangladesh and football in Bangladesh, how crazy they get. I mean, this is a crazy thing. Whether you have any money to eat or not, but you get excited about football, you get excited about cricket and spend your lifetime with that excitement. And it's a global. It's not just related to one particular culture or other particular culture. I said that is a pro big power. But today that power is used by money makers who want to make money out of it commercial use of sports. They sell products in the name of sports, using the sports people to promote their products. That's how sports is done. Media makes money out of it. I say such a big power, this can be used for social purpose, instead of just commercial purpose. I said there is a tremendous way how sports can be helpful in addressing the social issues. So I made my case and many people got interested in the subject. And I was invited by Mayor of Paris and Hidalgo in Rio after the speech. She wanted to use this idea in France. Then later I was invited to come to Paris to talk about it. And out of that, we came up with the idea of creating 
Olympic as a social business. So we started working on designing Olympic 2024 as a social business Olympic. And your idea is, for the case of uh, Olympic 2024, it is a project of about 7 billion euro. This is a lot of money in it. So my point was, every penny of that 7 billion euro should be used for a social purpose. Not wasted for, to give money, make profit for somebody else. It's a decision, it's something that you can do, it's in your hand. It's not that somebody is forcing you to give it. So I said, you have 7 billion euro budget. Question is, where did this money go? So now they're working on it. There are many, many different things that you can do about the housing, about the catering, about the procurement. At every stage, it has to be purposeful. Not just give the money, the lowest bidder gets the job, and that's not like that. What benefit the society gets out of this money? And then out of that, not only Olympic is one, every sport, <coughs> everything that is done can be used as a social business idea. So that's why we created the UNOS Social Business Hub. Today we are talking about them so here. They will be speaking. And how to bring that social business idea at every layer of the sports world. Use that power at every level. How to make it happen. Even the sports world itself has lots of problems. Sports is a very short-lived profession. By the time you become 30 or 35, you're downhill. You're not going to get back again. Your life in the sports is over. What happens after that? Nobody cares. It's a pain, but for most of them, it's a very painful life after that because they've not learned anything else. They've given their lifetime to make sure they succeed. Only few succeed, others don't. And they don't have any life for them. So we said, why should it be that way? We can solve, this is a problem. And social business is about solving problem. We can solve this problem too. Why don't we put our mind into it? So many ideas have started cropping up. Now these ideas are being used. That's how the link in the sports with the social business came about. So I'm very happy when I come here to discuss this and many more possibilities. Because the whole global sports is linked with Lausanne. And all the sports organizations are headquartered here. So once we can start thinking about it, it has a tremendous impact in the whole world. Young people can grow up completely differently just because you thought your life can be designed in a way which is useful to other people. It's not just me and my life, it's my life related to the rest of the people's life, how we relate to ourselves. And not because somebody is forcing you to do it, because you enjoy doing it. That's the most important thing. You have fun doing it. And you feel it's a life worth living. And that's why you do it, not because somebody <laughs> ordered you to do it. Nobody ordered you to do it. You do it because you think that's the right thing to do. So I hope lots of things will come out of this discussion and uh, it will continue and flourish and spread around the world. Thank you very much.